They come and pick him up and say, he's dead. This is the way I learned if you're talking. 320 volts. Then it was Habib's turn. He says the torture started from day one. They have, like, um, you see the American police use the, like, a gun, electric guns. That's what they use to go through in your body with... Like a cattle prod. That's what they use. They put the handcuff, turn you over, and they beat you in your feet. On the soles of your feet. Yeah, until they got swollen that big. And when they got too swollen, they get cream. They treat you. And after treating you, get you again. <laughs> Last month, we travelled to Cairo to investigate Mamdou Habib's story. Egypt is at the heart of what America calls the global war on terror. Plagued by its own Islamist insurgency, the country has been under emergency rule for 26 years. Draconian anti-terrorism laws have helped turn Egypt into a police state, which is routinely named by the US State Department as a human rights abuser. If you want to get a good interrogation, you send a prisoner to Jordan, and the prisons are full in Jordan of American prisoners. If you want somebody tortured to death, you send them to Syria. If you never want to hear from them again, send them to Egypt. That's pretty much the rule. In a crumbling colonial era high rise in downtown Cairo, lawyer and political activist Mohamed Zari runs the Human Rights Center for the Assistance of Prisoners. He says 5,000 political prisoners are currently being held without charge. Amnesty International says the total detained without charges is 18,000. Mohamed Zari says almost all of them are tortured. Torture in Egypt happens automatically. It happens in all political and criminal cases. There are more than 70 types of torture that citizens are subjected to different types of beating, beating with sticks, with bamboo, with a hose, with their hands and legs, electrodes on the hands, on the legs, on the tongue, the genitals. They flood the cell with water. This stops the person from sleeping and he spends all night standing up. There are many different methods of torture. The devil himself wouldn't speak of it. The treatment handed out to some Egyptian prisoners is graphically illustrated in mobile phone footage posted on the internet site YouTube. This man is a bus driver who was arrested last year after intervening to stop an argument between his brother and a policeman. When someone's rendered to Egypt, is there any doubt that they're going to be tortured? Oh, there's absolutely no doubt at all. Same with Syria. The rendition program was set up in Washington by Michael Scheuer, the longtime head of the CIA's bin Laden unit. We're pursuing um, a war. Uh, we're pursuing it very badly. And at the moment, the rendition program remains uh, the most successful U.S. counterterrorism program in the history of the country. Successful or not, rendition to Egypt would appear to be a flagrant violation of the United Nations Convention Against Torture, which states that no country shall expel, return or extradite a person to another state where there are substantial grounds for believing that he would be in danger of being subjected to torture. What did you expect would happen to people when they were sent to Egypt? Didn't care. Did you expect that people would be tortured in Egypt? I, I can say I wouldn't be surprised. We certainly raised the issue with the White House. Certainly uh, within the CIA, it was, it was clear that uh, there was no way we could uh, 
tell anyone honestly that someone would not be tortured if they were taken to a particular country. The Bush administration claims it always seeks an assurance from the country in question that people sent there will not be tortured. The United States has not transported anyone and will not transport anyone to a country when he, we believe he will be tortured. Where appropriate, the United States seeks assurances that transferred persons will not be tortured. What were those assurances worth? Well, they were, they, they saved the, they saved the conscience of cowardly politicians. Uh, they could say, we, di we did our best to make sure that uh, these people were, were treated according to some legal regime. Did you believe those assurances would be honoured? No, I didn't. Why would I believe that? Cairo lawyer Montassa El Zayat, who acts for the Muslim Brotherhood and Egyptian Jamar Islamia, has represented a number of rendition prisoners, including the very first who was rendered to Egypt in 1995, then disappeared, believed executed. El Zayat has also examined the case of Mamdou Habib. Here in Cairo, he was interrogated first by one of the general intelligence agencies, and then he was handed over to the State Security Intelligence Service, the internal security organization at Nasser City, where he was interrogated and tortured. El Zayat and others we spoke to believe that Habib was held in this detention centre, a citadel of Egypt's much-feared State Security Intelligence Service at Nasser City in Cairo. This is the building of the State Security Intelligence Service in Nasser City, the General Administration Building. It has special cells for the detention of arrested people or suspects. There are rooms underground so that no one knows they are there. Do you know what happens to people in those cells? It's the way that Mamdou Habib has described it. They got like a monkey bar. They, uh, they got you and lift you up to a guard and they handcuff you and shackle you. And they hang you like a monkey and someone got stick. The way the guard is to hit you, the way they come back, they hit you. And you have to be naked in this time. They got dogs. What do they do with the dogs? The dogs, they, they just pray to try to mentally to make you worried. But um, they tell them people they do sexual with dogs. You see. They, they told you that. Yeah. It's, that the they, dogs were trained to what do sexual acts. That's what they say. And uh, they just put you upside down, your face on the floor. They got your hand up, and you. You shackle your legs, your feet, and you have to be naked and to get the dogs through to you. And upset. And at some point, you told me they put you in a box. Can I rest? Yes, yeah, sure. He described how he was put in this room, dark, black room, windowless, no light at all, handcuffed, cuffs behind him. Water starts to flow into the room. He can hear the sound of water rushing in. He can feel it on his legs. He can't see it. Um, he feels the water rise up past his shins, past his knees, past his thighs. The water rises up past his stomach to his chest. He doesn't know where it's going to stop. He can scream. No one can hear him. Comes to his neck, comes to his chin. All he can do is rise up on his toes and step. Then the water stops. And so he's left there uh, on his toes, uh, uh, suspended in the water. Um, I, I, I can't even conceive of it. Uh, and he said he was left there for hours. The torture methods Habib describes have been corroborated by other prisoners and human rights groups. Another one was the box. The box is that size, I believe. I have a small hole. You've got very small light, they come through. 
They put you inside this box, and you don't know for how long. So it's like a coffin. Smaller than a coffin. Smaller than a coffin. In the coffin, you maybe you can uh, relax, but this one is not relax. How long were you in the box? No idea. In between torture sessions, Habib was interrogated over and over again. He says an Australian officer was present for at least one of these sessions. The Australian government denies this. Habib believes from the questions he was asked that the interrogators had information taken during an ASIO raid on his Sydney home, including telephone SIM cards. And they told me you have to tell us every single person in this number, who's he, how you know him, how we live, who's his family, what you connect with him, every single person. And who were these people? My family, mechanic, plumber. Everyone you know, everyone every, whose phone number you had in Sydney. Everyone, the people used to work with me, my next door neighbour. This. Everybody. Did they say anything about where they'd got this material? They said from my home. But how had the Egyptians got hold of it? How the Egyptian? They said the Australian gave it to him. They said this? Yes. Were we advised that he was going to be taken to another jurisdiction when he was taken? No, we weren't. We were not? No, we weren't. When did we first find out? Sometime after he had been transferred. And how did we find out? ASIO uh, was the source of information that he had been transferred. For the entire six months of Habib's detention in Egypt, and ever since then, the Australian government has disavowed any knowledge of his rendition and claimed his presence there was never confirmed by the Egyptian authorities. But a paper trail of government cables and other documents, many of them marked secret but released under freedom of information, shows that within days of his transfer, the government was aware that Habib was in Egypt and in the custody of an Egyptian agency. This unequivocal statement stands in stark contrast to the years of duplicity and dissembling that followed. The Egyptians have at no time acknowledged that they did actually detain Habib, though we for a long time believed that they did, did uh, detain him to the extent that when he was, we believe, in Egypt, and we know from what Habib said that he was in Egypt, um, our ambassador raised uh, his welfare and the fact that we thought the Egyptians had him with the Egyptian Prime Minister and other, other ministers and officials. Do we raise it with the US who took him there? In effect, abducted him from... Well, uh, I, don't have all, I, don't have, I don't have all the details of that. No, I don't have any evidence that the Americans took him there. As, to the best of my well, knowledge, the walk. Pakistan... Well, he, he went from Pakistan to Egypt. There are a lot of different ways you can get from Pakistan to Egypt. Some in the government even sought to cast doubt on whether Habib had been in Egypt at all. My understanding is we have a great deal of difficulty knowing what, if anything, occurred in relation to Mr Habib in Egypt uh, because the Egyptians have never acknowledged that he was in their custody. He was not certain himself whether he'd been to Egypt, uh, but it was that period of time that he was... Uh, uh, held captive that he's uh, alleged uh, that he was tortured. This cable was sent from the Foreign Affairs Department in Canberra on November 19, 2001, a matter of days after Habib's rendition, stating for a fact that Habib had been transferred to Egypt. Yet here's what the Secretary of DFAT told the Senate three years later. We don't know how he got to Egypt, if that's in fact where he was. And you you still can't confirm that he went to Egypt. Senator, that's a matter really that um, my briefing is that we have never received any confirmation from the Egyptian government that he was in their custody. This document sent by the Federal Police Liaison Officer in Islamabad to his head office, also on November 19, 2001, states that Habib had been removed